Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromycel technology. With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day, the first and only FDA approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. Do your patients know what presbyopia is? There are people who are afraid of the press. Have you talked to your patients about multifocal contact lenses? I've heard the bifocal, but not right, multifocal. Exactly. Not multifocal. Do you need help with your multifocal strategy? Learn more at the conclusion of this episode. Welcome back to part two of my interview with cardiac surgeon, Dr. Phil Ovedia. In part two, Dr. Ovedia discusses the best diet to prevent heart disease. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell. Also, please leave comments. Be sure to watch our full-length documentary, Open Your Eyes, on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube movies and shows. And tune into our brand new radio show, Saturday mornings at 9 a.m. Central Time on AM 1280, The Patriot. So I want to move, o move on to tests that people could have to see if they're at risk for cardiovascular disease. I know that you probably could just look at somebody's belly and say, that's enough. You got it. You got to get on the stick. You know, you got a big belly, you're at risk, but let's talk about some of the tests that be, could be done. Let's talk about uh, calcium scores, coronary artery calcium score, uh, that type of heart scan to measure coronary atherosclerosis or plaque to see if people are at risk for a vulnerable plaque that could basically burst and cause a heart attack. Yeah. So, you know, the coronary artery calcium scan is a um, simple to do CAT scan, uh, literally takes five minutes. They don't even have to put an IV in you. Uh, you just lay down in the CAT scanner, uh, have the scan done. Uh, most places, um, here in the U.S., it will cost you between 100 and maybe $200 at the most. And I've actually seen it as cheap as like $50. Um, it's not covered by insurance, unfortunately, in most circumstances. But, uh, you know, the out of the out of pocket self-pay prices are, are usually pretty reasonable. And what it shows us is the early stages of heart disease. So, you know, to go back in the conversation, like we said, um, for most people, their first indication that they have heart disease is when they have a heart attack or they start to develop symptoms. And that means that this process has already progressed pretty far. Uh, so, you know, similar to um, the push for women to get mammograms and for all people to get colonoscopies, um, the point is if we discover these problems early, we have a better chance of of avoiding, you know, death from them and and you know bad outcomes, disability from them. Uh, and the coronary artery calcium scan is really uh, the equivalent of the mammogram for breast cancer. It can show us the early stages of heart disease. Uh, and we know that if you get this scan and you have no calcium in your arteries. Um, your chances of developing heart disease over the next five to 10 years are very low. Uh, and, you know, the older you are, if you get a zero score, uh, you know, the, the less those chances are. Uh, so I think that the coronary artery calcium scan should be used much more than it is. Um, I really advocate for um, anyone over 40 to get this scan. And in some cases, it might make sense to get it in your 30s or even in your 20s if there's something that makes you think you're at higher risk of heart disease. Uh, and understand, you know, this score, getting a zero score, meaning you have no calcium in your arteries, uh, the chances of doing so are much higher when you're younger. Uh, 
Uh, but it becomes much more predictive the older you are. Uh, but, you know, start early, get a baseline scan when you're 40 or maybe earlier in some situations. And then it's something to be followed over time. Uh, these scans today are done with very low radiation doses. They're on the order of a chest X-ray in terms of the amount of radiation that you're going to get. So, you know, you can repeat the scan in five years or 10 years uh, if it shows that you have a zero score. If it shows that you don't have a zero score, one, it should prompt you to be working with a physician to really understand what you can do to now slow the progression of your heart disease. Um, and two, you should be following it more intensively. And so there are some patients that, you know, I'll get another scan a year later if we're really concerned about progression. But it is a very powerful test. It can diagnose heart disease at much earlier stages than we typically do today. And I think that in and of itself uh, can have a major impact on, um, you know, outcomes from heart disease. Now, the calcium is about 20% of the total atherosclerotic plaque. So that means there's 80% other material that's in there. And the bigger the number, that means the greater risk of having plaque rupture. So my question is this, is the calcium that's there, is that protective for that part of the atherosclerotic plaque uh, once the calcium is there? Yeah, so this is actually a controversial uh, subject and, and really not clear. Um, the theory has always been that, you know, the calcium, uh, like you said, stabilizes that plaque. One of the things that can lead to heart attacks um, is, you know, is, well, there are two pathways that we can think of to heart attacks, I guess is how I'll say it. You know, we can have a gradual buildup of this atherosclerotic material in the heart. And it gets to a point where it is now critically narrowing a blood vessel uh, and cutting off the blood supply. Um, or we can have some plaque that builds up and all of a sudden uh, what we call a plaque rupture, that plaque basically separates from the blood vessel wall, causes a blood clot essentially to form around it and blocks off that blood vessel uh, leading to a heart attack. Now, um, the theory around calcification in these plaques is that once calcium is deposited in these plaques, uh, that stabilizes it. Uh, that will then prevent it from having this plaque rupture. Uh, but it's not entirely clear that that's true. And what we do know is the higher your calcium score is, the more calcium that you have in the blood vessels of your heart, the higher your risk of having a heart attack is. Uh, so I wouldn't, um, you know, I, I wouldn't uh, necessarily bank on the fact that if you have calcified plaque, uh, you know, you're going to be safe from cardiac events. And, you know, you are right uh, that, you know, the calcium score doesn't give us the whole picture. It doesn't show us all of the plaque. Uh, and that's why I refer to the calcium score as a screening test. Uh, and in other words, if you have a zero calcium score, we can be pretty well assured that you're at very low risk of heart disease. It's not zero, but it's pretty low. Um, if you have a lot of calcium, we can assume that you're gonna have a lot of non-calcified plaque with that. And those are the people that we need to be you know, pretty concerned about that you may be at very high risk of it developing heart disease. And maybe you need the more invasive testing then like a catheterization or a CT angiogram. Uh, but at least the calcium uh, score can be an early screening test to give you an indication as to whether or not you're at risk for heart disease. And my understanding is that the, the score increases about 25% a year. And that if you go on a statin and you eat a low fat diet and you exercise and take aspirin, it still goes up 25% a year. So uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, so there's actually some data that suggests that statins might accelerate the calcification process. Uh, and this is really where this theory about plaque stabilization came from, uh, because there was this sort of concerning finding when you look at statins and coronary artery calcium scans, 
And over time, people that are on statins tend to increase their coronary artery calcium scan more. And all of a sudden, we came up with this theory that that's a good thing because it's stabilizing these plaques. And like I said, that 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 hypothesis has yet to be proven, I would say. Um, one of the things we do know, the flip side of this is that if your calcium score doesn't progress as expected, which is about 20 to 25% per year, we know that that puts you at a lower, puts you into a lower risk category. Uh, so this is another reason that I advocate for not only getting one scan, but then following it over time, uh, because when we're doing things like, um, you know, changing to, for instance, a low carb diet instead of a low fat diet, which uh, I would advocate um, does a better job of preventing heart disease. Um, one of the measures that we can use to tell if we're, you know, these interventions are working is by the slowing of the progression of coronary artery calcification, something that I've now seen in many of my patients. And now let's talk about some of the things that can decrease uh, ca the calcium score from going up and maybe even reverse it. I saw some data on vitamin D. Now, if you can get mm -hmm. vitamin D between 60 and 80. And I was wondering what you thought about vitamin D and berberine and omega-3s that maybe don't reverse it, but stabilize it. Do you have a feeling on any of those? I know you're not a big supplement person, but yeah. uh, what do you think about that? So, you know, it turns out that vitamin D, um, calcium, and then another vitamin, vitamin K2, uh, have a very important interrelationship in our bodies. And um, basically what you can think of is that vitamin K2 and vitamin D uh, help to um, keep the calcium where we want it in our bodies, which is mostly in our bones. That's the main place that we want calcium to be in our bodies. That's where it has the most utility. And um, when vitamin D levels are low and vitamin K2 levels are low, that calcium is likely to get pulled out of the bone and then can go and deposit in places like blood vessel walls that we don't necessarily want calcium. Uh, so vitamin D, vitamin K2, I think are very important parts of this process. And um, we, you know, again, uh, vitamin D, it turns out, is largely a marker of our metabolic health. Uh, one of the things that I have now seen in many patients is as they improve their metabolic health without, you know, taking more supplements or without spending more time in the sun, they see increases in their vitamin D levels. Uh, so vitamin D may just be a, another way of, of measuring metabolic health, as it turns out, uh, but it does seem to be very important. And having a low vitamin D level is certainly concerning when it comes to the development of heart disease. I never recommend vitamin D3 without also taking vitamin K2 with right. it. Is that something you would agree with? Yes, I would definitely agree with that. You know, so when I when I talk to people about vitamin D supplementation, two things to point out. First of all, it should be vitamin D3, uh, not vitamin D, D2, which is in a lot of the, uh, you know, less expensive, uh, less well-made vitamin D supplements because our body really can't use vitamin D2. And then, as you said, it should always be vitamin D3 with K2 because K2 is going to be uh, that other part uh, that can um, help prevent the calcium from ending up in our bones, uh, from ending up in our blood vessels rather than our bones where we want it. Uh, and um, if you take the vitamin D without the K2, you may end up in a situation where Again, that calcium is getting pulled out of your bones and deposited in your blood vessels. There was this uh, a, a medication that I've learned about recently, cyclodextrin, that uh, they use to treat demon pick disease, and which is an inherited uh, disease, demon pick. I'm sure you know which, where people can't process fats and they can't metabolize fats or cholesterol. 
And I was wondering if you heard anything about the cyclodextrin and they're selling it over the counter, I think in Australia to reverse, uh, to reverse uh, plaque, plaque in the blood vessels. And I was wondering if you knew anything about that or you could share anything about that. Um, no, actually that's not one that I'm uh, particularly uh, familiar with. Uh, you know, Neiman pick disease, as you mentioned, is a, is a very interesting uh, kind of uh, model to look at as to these effects on, you know, fat metabolism uh, and fat utilization and uh, what the uh, sort of outcomes are that, uh, uh, you know, outcomes of that are. Uh, but I haven't uh, really come across cyclodextrins uh, as of yet. Something I will uh, always will look into and uh, continue on the always learning pathway. Well, there's a, there's a, they, there's a, there's a supplement or medication called Remcol that's made with cyclodextrin, which is a ring of actual sugars that go and pick out some of the cholesterol, but they, they seem to reverse the calcium score. And, and, uh, you know, I love to get back to you on that when you analyze it. How about licorice root? Have you, have you heard anything about licorice root uh, glycerizer uh, for stabilizing plaque? Yeah, so licorice root um, is something uh, that, uh, you know, I've seen talked about. And, you know, again, what licorice root and many of these other supplements seem to do is uh, assist with this insulin resistance and metabolic disease process. And so ultimately, I think anything that improves insulin resistance is going to help slow the progression of coronary disease and uh, potentially even uh, you know, uh, lead to reversals of coronary disease, which, uh, you know, I have seen in some situations. Uh, but, you know, uh, insulin resistance is really, I think, what needs to be the focus of anyone who has coronary disease uh, and anyone who doesn't have it and is trying to prevent it. And so um, anything that is going to help us improve insulin resistance and there are a few supplements that certainly do this, things like berberine and, and maybe cinnamon and, and some other, um, you know, things. Uh, other um, supplements that are going to be, that may be helpful with this is, uh, are the ones that are going to lower inflammation, things like, uh, you know, curcumin and turmeric. Uh, but ultimately, um, supplements like medications uh, if they're being taken to sort of undo the side effects of uh, the food that we are eating and the lifestyle choices that we are making uh, are not going to be as effective as if we address these primary causes of insulin resistance, which are the food that we eat and the uh, lifestyle habits that we uh, maintain. I want to ask you about the endopad for endothelial dysfunction. I know some of the functional medicine people are using that for a diagnosis. And do you have a feeling about that? Well, so endothelial dysfunction is certainly a key part in this process. Uh, and it's the damage to the endothelium of the blood vessels uh, that really is that first step that ultimately leads to plaque formation and atherosclerosis. So I think, you know, a focus on the endothelium is very important. Um, I don't think we yet fully understand uh, what that involves. Uh, so, you know, again, I go back to something like insulin resistance, and one of the many downstream effects that we've seen of insulin resistance is damage to the endothelium and dysfunction of the endothelium. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it, it's a... Um, Targeting the endothelium specifically, I would say, is something that we're still trying to figure out. Uh, diagnosing the endothelial dysfunction, uh, again, is something that we are trying to figure out. Uh, but it certainly seems to be uh, a very important part of the process that then leads to heart disease. And before you talked about a damage to the cholesterol particles, because of insulin resistance. And we talked yep. about five things that people should check for. Uh, so let's talk about the NMR uh, test and particle size, particle number. And 
when the LDL particles become, you get a lot of particle, a high amount of particle, very small particle size and particle number from eating a lot of grains or sugar, those seem to, to hang around longer uh, in the body and they could wind up in the gap junctions in the endothelium of the blood vessels then become inflamed and maybe lead to plaque rupture. And I wanted to know what you're feeling about doing that type of test in NMR to look at particle size and particle number. Yeah, so uh, NMR uh, is uh, in a way, is an advanced test of uh, your lipids, of your cholesterol particles. Um, and it probably, you know, uh, is not going to be in the standard testing that you get from your, you know, primary care physician. And even many cardiologists don't do this type of testing. Uh, so what the NMR test basically does is, you know, as we mentioned, um, LDL, HDL, these are um, lipoproteins that carry cholesterol through the bloodstream. And it turns out that these are basically families of particles. Uh, so, you know, within LDL, within HDL, uh, there were then uh, distributions uh, based on the size of the particles. Uh, and this information becomes very important because what we know is that the small particles, um, this we call them small, dense LDL particles, these are the ones that participate in plaque formation. And it turns out that LDL particles that are large, large buoyant or large fluffy particles, we'll call them, don't participate in this plaque formation. So, you know, when you get the standard cholesterol panel uh, from your doctor and it reports your LDL, all it's reporting is the total uh, amount, the total mass of LDL that you have in your bloodstream. But it's not telling us you know, is that all in large fluffy particles or is that all in small dense particles? And um, knowing that differentiation uh, gives us a lot more information. Uh, and I would put forth that if you have a lot of large fluffy particles, yes, your LDL cholesterol level is going to be higher, uh, but that is probably not a concerning situation and is not going to be a situation that's going to be promoting heart disease, uh, atherosclerosis formation. On the flip side, and this is a situation that I now see commonly, um, you might have a low amount of LDL cholesterol, maybe because you're on a medication like a statin, um, but all of the LDL cholesterol that you have are these small dense particles. And that I think is a very concerning situation. And that is why I think we see so many people who are on statin medications with low levels of LDL cholesterol still developing heart disease and still seeing worsening of the heart disease that they have. Um, so much more powerful information um, and something that I think most people should be pushing their doctors to test. Uh, now, your doctor is going to push back. They're going to tell you that the test is too expensive. Insurance doesn't cover it, uh, both of which really aren't true. Uh, it turns out that most of the time insurance does cover this testing. Um, and even if you have to pay out of pocket, it can be done very affordably. Uh, I, I work with a number of like, you know, companies that specialize in self-pay situations, and you can get an NMR panel done for as cheap as $50. Uh, so it's really not that expensive a test. It tells us a lot more information and it's underutilized. And I, I think that's largely just because doctors haven't been educated on what it means and how to use it. Uh, but I believe it to be another key uh, factor in, um, you know, in, in us doing a better job of determining who's truly at risk for heart disease and what changes we need to make. Now, um, the biggest influence on whether your particles are small or large is going to be insulin resistance. And in fact, this is such a powerful influencer of uh, the size of your lipid particles 
that it turns out that we can actually, based on the size of your lipid particles, determine if you're insulin resistant or not. Uh, so there's a uh, sort of add-on test that can be done with the NMR panel. It's called LPIR, lipoprotein insulin resistance score. And what it does is it looks at the size of a couple of different types of particles, your LDL particles, your HDL particles, and your VLDL particles. And based on the breakdown of the different size particles that you have, it can actually inform you whether or not you're insulin resistant. Uh, so I'm a big fan of that, uh, of, of that test as well, and uh, something else that people could be asking their doctors for. And how about LP little a? Yeah, so LP little a, lipoprotein A, is another uh, subtype of cholesterol particle. So lipoprotein A uh, is actually a protein that attaches to some LDL cholesterol particles. Um, and what lipoprotein A does is it basically makes that cholesterol particle uh, more sticky is the way that I describe it to people. Uh, but it basically can allow that particle to now uh, interact with the blood clotting system. And so um, again, you know, we've mentioned a few times that blood clotting is another important part of the process in heart disease. And so people with elevated lipoprotein A levels are at increased risk of heart disease because of this interaction now between their cholesterol particles and the blood clotting system. Uh, it's, an it's an oftentimes unrecognized risk factor for heart disease. And um, this actually is one place where genetics do seem to play a significant role in that most people um, who have, you know, a low lipoprotein A level, uh, if you check it, you know, at some point during your life, uh, that is sort of genetically determined and you're probably going to stay low. And the people that have higher lipoprotein A levels, again, largely genetically determined, and that's probably going to stay high. Um, however, I, I have seen people lower their lipoprotein A levels somewhat when they make diet and lifestyle changes. So it's not purely genetics, uh, but there does seem to be a significant influence uh, as to whether or not you'll have this additional risk factor uh, for the development of heart disease. MacuHealth, your science born and tested solutions for visual performance, macular degeneration, and dry eye syndrome. New products coming soon. Embrace the science. I've had three patients in my career in the 20s that had a branch retinal vein occlusion, which is a stroke in the eye. And all of them, they, it turned out the cause was high LP little a. They, they couldn't find any other cause other than elevated LP little a. So, you know, I know most doctors don't check for it, but it's probably a good thing to know what your LP little a is. And yeah, and, and certainly if you've had a heart attack, if you've had a stroke, uh, and maybe, you know, the explanation for that isn't clear, uh, checking a lipoprotein A level, I would say, is definitely indicated. And one of your articles recently, you talked about stress. What do you think about heart math uh, as far as reducing stress and anxiety to correlate with, with uh, for prevention of heart disease or maybe prevention of even secondary, for secondary patients? Yeah, so stress is uh, certainly a important part of um, the heart disease process. Um, it turns out that, you know, chronic stress um, is one of the things that contributes to our poor metabolic health and makes us more in likely to be insulin resistant. Um, and again, stress um, is something that we don't exactly know yet how to quantify. Uh, you know, there are a number of different uh, kind of ways that we assess how stressed people are. And what I talk to people about stress is, you know, we can't eliminate stress from our lives. We all have stress uh, that's kind of all around us all the time. But what we need to do as individuals is figure out how to manage that stress, how to deal with that stress. And, you know, that can take lots of different approaches. Uh, for some people, it's things like meditation. 
For other people, it might be religion. Uh, it might be having a strong, you know, community that you can rely upon, your friends, your family, um, whatever it is for you. Uh, we just need to figure out those ways to deal with this stress. Um, when we look at the relationship between stress and heart disease, um, you know, stress in of itself has been shown to be a cause of heart disease. There's a condition, it's called uh, Takasubo cardiomyopathy. Uh, and what that is, is when people have very stressful events, um, their heart basically behaves like it's had a heart attack. The heart function decreases, the heart sort of gets stunned, uh, but you do catheterizations on these people and you don't actually see blockages in the blood vessels. Um, it probably has to do with uh, the nervous system and our heart is uh, very intricately related with the nervous system. Uh, people may have heard of the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous systems, and those uh, both have direct innervation of the heart. Um, and so, um, you know, when that gets out of balance uh, with a sudden stressful event, that seems to be what leads to this, uh, this condition. Uh, but stress, very important. It's one of the pillars of metabolic health uh, that I talk to people about and figuring out how to manage it for yourself uh, can be very important. What do you think of the power of the carotid IMT? Uh, do you think that that's helpful uh, for diagnosis, for early diagnosis? Yeah, so, you know, the uh, CIMT or carotid intimal medial thickness test um, it's an ultrasound of the neck that gets done, so it's non-invasive, um, and we look at the thickness of the wall of your carotid artery, and that's been correlated with your risk of um, heart disease, uh, of plaque in your heart. Um, what I tell people is, you know, it's not as good as a coronary artery calcium scan because, you know, it's an indirect, we're looking up here when we're really concerned with here in our heart. And the other problem with the CIMT test is it's a little bit more challenging to get done well. Uh, to finding someone who, uh, a, a ultrasonographer, uh, a technician who really knows how to do the test well and uh, we can rely on the results from test to test being, uh, you know, consistent um, is difficult because basically the way that ultrasounds are done, you're dealing with, um, you know, sound waves uh, and you're dealing with the angle that you're holding the probe and the angle that you're looking at the artery. So I find that there's a lot of variability in the quality of that testing. The coronary artery calcium scan, again, I find is a more uh, reproducible, more reliable test. Uh, so I'd rather have a CAC scan, but if for some reason you can't get a CAC scan, a CIMT uh, can be uh, another indicator that we can use. And the last one before we go on to diet is heart rate variability. You know, there's the EKG and yep. do we want a big heart rate variability? Do we want a small one? As we get older, the variability seems to get less. Tell us about that. Yeah, so heart rate variability gets back to what uh, we were referring to earlier with the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems and the balance between the two. So heart rate variability is a measurement. Um, you know, we, again, you know, when people think about their heart rate, and for instance, let's say your heart rate is 60 beats per minute, uh, people think, you know, uh, the, the common perception is that that means that you're heart is beating every second, but it's very consistent. And it turns out that there are small variations uh, from beat to beat, uh, millisecond variations from beat to beat. And that heart rate variability uh, is then showing us the balance between your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. Uh, and in general, having higher HRV uh, is better. Um, now, the caution I give people around HRV is again, it's very hard to measure well. And there are a lot of wearable devices out there on the market today that purport uh, you know, to measure HRV, but probably don't do a very good job of it. Uh, and then there's also, you know, um, because of the different measurement devices and techniques, 
we don't have an absolute number. So I can't tell you that, you know, your HRV should really be above X. It's going to depend on the device you're using. And overall, you know, over time, the trend I want to see is that your HRV is getting higher uh, with, with whatever device that you're using. Uh, that is probably an indicator that, you know, you're doing a better job of managing stress and, and some of the other factors that go into it. Now, does the EKG measure heart rate variability? Um, again, it has to be done. You, you can't really do it um, with a standard EKG machine. It's not going to report HRV. Uh, uh, you, you kind of need some advanced analytics of the EKG to then determine what your HRV is. So before we go to diet, the, for the person at home listening, what test should they do? Should it just be a calcium score? Should it be, should they fractionate their lipids? Uh, we talked about triglycerides. What do you recommend uh, that tomorrow they wake up, they want to make, see if they're at risk for a heart attack? We talked about a lot of different tests. What yeah. tests of those that we talked about, or what maybe we missed one, should somebody go and get tomorrow to see if they're at risk? Yeah. So ultimately, um, you know, I first want people to know if they are insulin resistant or not. Uh, and so uh, something like a fasting insulin level, uh, something like an LPIR score, uh, you know, even looking at the ratio between your triglycerides and your HDL cholesterol, which we kind of mentioned, but didn't go into the specifics of. Uh, but if you divide your triglycerides by your HDL cholesterol level. Uh, and importantly, this needs to be done in milligrams per deciliter in US units. Um, you want that ratio ideally to be less than one and a half. And that's a pretty good indicator that you're not insulin resistant. But one, some measure of insulin resistance, I think is important. And then I think the coronary artery calcium scan is very important for most people if they're unsure if they have heart disease. If you already know you have heart disease, the coronary artery calcium scan may be extraneous at that point. Um, but um, those are probably the two uh, things at a high level that I would recommend to people. Okay, let's talk about diet now. Let's talk about how we're going to help these people. You know, we know that 90% of the people probably are insulin resistant. They're, they're going to fail the metabolic test. So they got to get on the stick right now. And People don't know how to eat. Should they eat vegan? Should they eat uh, whole food? Should they be carnivore? How, how, how should they eat? What, what do you think? Well, I think the high level advice that I would give people is to eat whole real food. Um, and, you know, what that means to me is basically the things that grow in the ground and the things that eat the things that grow in the ground. Uh, so um, plants and animals are really what we want to you know, build and construct our diet around. And, you know, there's some debate about, you know, whether all plants, all animals or something in between is probably the best approach. Um, what I would tell people is um, if you are not metabolically healthy, so if you're one of those 88 to 94% of the adults in the United States that is not in optimal metabolic health uh, by those measures we talked about, that means that your body is not processing carbohydrates well, and that is carbohydrates from all forms. So sugar, certainly, uh, you know, the highly refined processed carbohydrates like flour uh, and, uh, you know, grains are going to be problematic. But even carbohydrates from vegetables might be problematic for you if you are severely insulin resistant. And so, um avoiding carbohydrates and eating mostly proteins and fats, um, which is going to kind of steer you more towards an animal-based diet, uh, is going to be useful for you. Uh, does everyone need to be full carnivore? Um, probably not, uh, but it certainly is an option. And one of the things that I really stress to people is uh, that red meat is not what is doing damage to our heart and our heart health. And there is no reason that you should fear eating red meat. And in fact, I do know many people, uh, myself included, who have gone on carnivore diets and maintained carnivore diets, and it greatly improves insulin resistance and greatly, uh, you know, improves overall and heart health. Uh, so 
um, whole real food first and foremost. And then, you know, depending on your situation, you can figure out that balance between plant and animal products that's going to serve you best. And if you, you when you eat animals that have uh, ruminants with multiple stomachs, yeah. talk about the advantage of that versus a chicken that maybe has one stomach. Yeah, so uh, ruminant animals, like you said, they have multiple stomachs and these are gonna be cows, uh, these are going to be, uh, you know, buffalo, uh, bison. These are going to be many of the uh, game animals, uh, you know, that uh, people may have access to. Uh, and what they are able to do, one of the things they are able to do with their multiple stomachs is um, convert uh, unsaturated fats in their diet back to saturated fats. Non-ruminant animals like chickens, uh, like pigs, and like humans uh, can't do this. So if uh, a non-ruminant animal is being fed a diet that is high in unsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats in particular, uh, that is going to end up in their fat. And if you're eating a lot of their fat, that might be a source of polyunsaturated fats. And, you know, we haven't really touched on that part of it yet, but you, you, you referred earlier to Dr. Kenobi. Uh, and, you know, it seems that polyunsaturated fats are one of the things that have dramatically increased in our diets during the time that heart disease was dramatically increasing and metabolic disease was dramatically increasing. And on a um, molecular level, um, when you look at how these fats are processed by our bodies, processed by our cells, uh, there are reasons to be concerned that a high consumption of polyunsaturated fats are uh, one of the major contributors uh, to um, metabolic disease and heart disease. Uh, and so this is where I get back to the eating whole real food concept. Because if you're eating whole real food, for the most part, you're not going to be getting these excessive levels of polyunsaturated fats that we are getting from processed foods. Yeah, I mean, he, Dr. Kenobi talks about linoleic acid from the different oils, the inflammatory oils, peanut oil, safflower oil, canola oil, yeah. uh, sunflower oil, uh, cottonseed oil, these oils, when he looked at these oils, and I did a podcast with him, and I know you, you're you have his book, so you, you you probably know him pretty well. He was able to correlate chronic disease when they started adding these oils to, to the food. Although the oils lower the cholesterol, but it inflames the cholesterol. It causes the cholesterol to become inflamed. The, uh, exactly. The cholesterol. So that's why we become more inflamed when we're eating those type of foods. And he tied it to cancer, like I said, macular degeneration, cardiovascular disease, and you name it, depression. Uh, if you could comment on on his findings in his book and what you what you thought about it when you when you speak with Kenobi or you read his book. Yeah, I think it is a very concerning aspect of our food supply. You know, ultimately when we look at processed food, um, it is obvious that processed food is, is you know, worsening our health. Um, what's, you know, not obvious is which component of the processed food is worsening our health. Is it these vegetable and seed oils? Um, is it the highly refined carbohydrates, the sugar and the, you know, uh, highly processed grains and, and wheat and flour that's causing it? Um, and, you know, Honestly, the answer is I don't know, uh, but I know if we eliminate processed food and we eliminate all of this stuff from our diet, our health gets better. Um, you know, there is many reasons to point to the vegetable and seed oils uh, because, you know, someone can step back and say, well, we've been eating sugar for a long, long time. And that's true. Uh, not in the amounts that we eat it today, but it has been a part of our food supply. You can say the same thing about, you know, grains and, and flour. Again, you know, we have been eating these things for uh, longer periods of time, um, but it's really the vegetable and seed oils that were the recent introduction into our food supply. And, and these things literally didn't exist prior to, you know, 100, 150 years ago in any noticeable uh, quantity. 
uh, and during the time that they have been prominent in our food supply is when our health has been getting worse. So I do have a lot of concerns. Um, I tell people, avoid vegetable and seed oils uh, as much as possible. Uh, you know, contrary to the advice of the American Heart Association, uh, eating canola uh, oil and vegetable oil is not good for our heart health. And uh, I prefer people use natural fats like animal fats and, um, you know, unprocessed oils like olive oil, avocado oil, and coconut oil uh, that, um, you know, uh, that don't contain these high amounts of linoleic acid and polyunsaturated fats. In, in your book, you talked about the 12 deadly food lies. If you could give us a little bit about that, uh, about what you meant about the 12 deadly food lies. Yeah, well, I talk about the 12 myths when it comes to our health overall, uh, but a lot of them are focused on our food. And, um, you know, uh, probably the one that is going to be uh, most, um, the, will resonate most with people is um, the understanding of uh, our food pyramid. Uh, and understand that, you know, the food pyramid, like we mentioned earlier, was introduced in 1980 uh, as part of the U.S. Dietary Guidelines with the uh, specific intent of lowering heart disease. Uh, and in fact, you know, during the time that we've been following this dietary advice, um, our health overall has gotten dramatically worse and heart disease has not gotten any better. Uh, so, you know, things like obesity and diabetes, which have literally skyrocketed, uh, since the introduction of the U S dietary guidelines. Um, and again, it's, I believe because the food pyramid pushes us more towards processed food uh, by saying that we should minimize uh, red meat in the diet, uh, eliminate things like animal fats and, and you know, minimize dairy products. Uh, uh, it pushes us towards a processed food diet. And then the whole base of that pyramid is, you know, processed grains, cereals, breads, pasta, things like this. Uh, and clearly our health has worsened while we've been following this advice. So I guess industry uh, gets involved in that and, and they participate in these food pyramids. So you have the, the principles of metabolic health as we wrap up here. If we could go through some of your principles of metabolic health. Uh, the first is to reframe your health and have a lot more of a long-term goal than a short-term goal. Yeah, so I think this is a very important, uh, you know, kind of mindset uh, pillar when it comes to metabolic health, uh, which is we don't want to be focused on these short term goals. Uh, you know, we really need to be thinking of our health as a system and finding the long term habits that can support that system well. And the next was eating the whole real food. Uh, just to summarize what you said before, so the person at home has it, a clear uh, thought process, what to eat for breakfast, lunch, dinner, what they should eat, what they shouldn't eat, you know, just to kind of summarize, you, you said it before, but let them know again what what they should what they should and what they shouldn't eat to prevent cardiovascular disease. Yeah, basically stick to the things that grow in the ground and the things that eat the things that grow in the ground uh, is my simple rule when it comes to that. And the other kind of thing I tell people is you should be able to look at what you're eating and know exactly what's in that food. And exercise. There's strength exercise and cardio exercise. And what's the advantage of strength exercise over cardio? Yeah, so for most people, um, the focus on building and maintaining muscle as they age uh, is going to be more beneficial to them uh, than, uh, you know, these, car these cardio exercises uh, that we're told that we need to do. And, um, you know, muscle ultimately is a more metabolically active tissue. Uh, and we know that the more that you're able to build and maintain muscle as you get older, uh, the longer you live and the better quality of life that you'll have. Sleep. Yeah, sleep is another very important aspect when it comes to metabolic health. 
our body needs that adequate time to uh, kind of rest and repair. And so getting adequate sleep uh, becomes a very uh, important component of maintaining good metabolic health. Decrease stress. Yep, we've talked a lot about stress. And like I said, it's not really decreasing it per se, it's uh, decreasing the impact that the stress has on you and figuring out how to well manage your stress. Safe sun. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, exposure to uh, the sun um, is another very important uh, aspect of our metabolic health. Um, we evolved in the sun and uh, we shouldn't be fearing the sun as we're oftentimes told today. And protect our gut. Uh, yeah, protecting your gut, um, you know, ties into a lot of this. It turns out that the inflammation, um, you know, is oftentimes related to our gut because of these foods that we're eating. Uh, so this is another important aspect uh, of um, maintaining good metabolic health. I have to ask you about this procedure called, or this treatment called EECP, Enhanced External Counterpulsation, where you're growing collaterals in the heart to protect your heart. Uh, you know, I think it kind of lost favor because maybe it took a lot of time to do. Do you think there's any validity to that? And uh, do you think that could help people that might have had needed a stent or is at risk for a heart attack? Why are they changing their diet and doing all the right things, but maybe to grow some collaterals in their heart? Yeah, so EECP, um, which basically involves kind of uh, almost blood pressure cuffs that you put on the legs or the arms, uh, and they seem to stimulate uh, some of the factors uh, that help our body to uh, make new blood vessels and heal the endothelium. So one of the ways that our body compensates for blockages that develop in the arteries of the heart is we form what are called collaterals, new blood vessels that kind of go around the blockages. Now, typically these aren't going to be um, as good as our blood vessels, uh, but you know it can be a strategy um, for dealing with this. Um, EECP, I think really has limited uh, utility ultimately. Uh, because the people with advanced disease, it usually isn't enough to really uh, meaningfully impact uh, the state of their disease. And people with earlier disease, again, probably don't really benefit all that much from it, um, which has been a problem. And um, yeah, maybe it, it might be useful as an adjunct. Uh, but again, I go back to address your metabolic health, address your insulin resistance, that's going to give you the biggest sort of bang for the buck when it comes to heart disease. And do you think people should use a continuous glucose monitor for prevention so they know what to eat, they know what foods raise their blood sugar real a lot, and which they don't? I wish they had one for ins insulin. Yeah, exactly. So we, we didn't get a chance to touch on this much, uh, maybe for another episode. But yeah, continuous glucose monitors, I do believe are one of the most powerful tools we have uh, at our disposal when it comes to uh, overcoming insulin resistance, figuring out which foods are, are spiking your blood sugar. I agree with you, you know, being able to monitor insulin uh, would be another great uh, tool uh, that we don't have. We only have the blood test, which obviously can only be done so often. Uh, but uh, continuous glucose monitors, I'm a big fan of them. I use them uh, with almost all of my patients these days. And my last question, and just a quick topic, a, a short thing on this, is that the vaccine causing blood clots, causing myocarditis, pericarditis, is that real? Is the vaccine really causing side effects of myocarditis, pericarditis, uh, early heart attacks, like what happened with LeBron James' son, and a lot of these athletes that are dying suddenly, uh, from these heart attacks, why are they why are they dying suddenly? Yeah, so you know there certainly have been very concerning signals around the vaccine uh, around COVID as well. We know that the spike protein uh, of the COVID virus um, leads to increased uh, risk of blood clots, and whether you're getting that spike protein from exposure to the virus itself or the vaccine. 
uh, there seems to be problems. Young men in particular, uh, for reasons that we still don't quite understand, uh, are most seem to be most prone uh, to this inflammation that develops in the heart, uh, the myocarditis, uh, in reaction to the vaccine. Uh, and again, you know, uh, from the COVID virus itself, uh, it seems to be spike protein related. My biggest uh, message around COVID is that COVID is a metabolic disease. It was very clear from the earliest days of COVID uh, that people who were in poor metabolic health were more likely to get COVID and then more likely to suffer serious consequences from uh, COVID. Uh, so what I would have loved to see the messaging be uh, that, you know, we should be improving our metabolic health, um, implementing, you know, many of the uh, things we talked about in terms of changing your diet and all of the other lifestyle factors. And I believe that if we weren't in such poor metabolic health, uh, we would, you know, this virus would have been uh, a non-issue. Uh, and for those of us who are in good metabolic health, uh, I know, you know, many people uh, who got COVID, you know, in good metabolic health, and it was a cold or even an unknown, uh, you know, they didn't even realize they got COVID, you know, they just happened to sort of uh, test for it. So um, uh, improving your metabolic health uh, should be our best way of preventing similar future pandemics, and we really need to address uh, the uh, pandemic of poor metabolic health uh, if we're going to uh, have a good chance of long-term survival. The last thing, for people that are seeing people who died suddenly from cardiovascular disease getting early strokes, and they've taken the vaccine and they want something for prevention, I've understood, like uh, Peter McCullough is saying, natokinase, curcumin, uh, bromelain. Is there anything, maybe aspirin, is there anything that you think people could do that maybe are worried now that they think the spike is in them and they want to try to do some kind of prevention? Do you have any kind of supplements or any tricks other than, of course, being metabolically, metabolically healthy, any kind of supplements to help these people? Yeah. So first and foremost, I would say, you know, improve your metabolic health, lower your overall inflammation. Um, so both aspirin and natokinase, uh, because of their, uh, you know, uh, ability to modulate the blood clotting system, I think are, uh, are, are interesting. Um, you know, certainly uh, early on, you know, my patients that were getting uh, COVID, uh, I would recommend to them that they take aspirin uh, on a daily basis um, for a, a period of time. Baby aspirin or full aspirin? Um, at that time, I would recommend a full aspirin if you've been diagnosed with COVID. Uh, and, and I was telling people to do it for 90 days. I think that's a low risk intervention uh, that seemed to have some benefit. Um, you know, of course, these things weren't studied uh, in the way that I wish they were. Uh, you know, the focus was on uh, pharmaceuticals, as it usually is. Uh, and, you know, this is situations where people need to take charge of their health, ad advocate for their own health. Uh, but uh, my approach uh, to COVID and the one that I recommended to my patients was improve your metabolic health. And then, um, you know, you really don't need to worry about these other things. Dr. Filovadia. You've been wonderful. You've been so generous with your time. I want to thank you. If people want to buy your book, they want to find out more about you. They want to watch your podcast. They want to be part of your uh, membership. Tell us how we could do that. Yeah. So the best place to find me is uh, at iFix Hearts. Uh, so you can go to ifixhearts.com, uh, which is the website. Find out about, uh, you can get the book there. Uh, the book is also widely available on Amazon, over on uh, social media, on Twitter, uh, at iFix Hearts is where I'm most active. You can also just look me up on uh, Instagram. And then um, Ovadia Heart Health is my private telemedicine practice that I work with people uh, throughout the US uh, on the uh, prevention and management of heart disease. And uh, again, if you just, you can go to ifixhearts.com and get uh, started, uh, talk to my team about becoming a member of my medical practice. Dr. Vedia, thank you so much. 
I really appreciate your time. You're really a great humanitarian. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you for everything you're doing, Kerry. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromycel technology. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner, not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit oiebroadcasting.com and sign up today.